Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, thanks for, for joining me the, this afternoon, uh, still morning out here in, in the Midwest. Um, so as, as you may have heard, I do work for the Army, so please excuse me if there aren't enough ships and sails in here, um, but I made sure to highlight uh, naval elements of this as well, because I do think it transcends uh, any, any branch. So the title of my talk today is Gentlemen Soldiers Honor George Washington and the Ethics of the American Revolution. And what I'm going to do is take you um, broadly from the French and Indian War through the War of 1812 uh, as quickly as I can in 40 or 45 minutes and highlight what these terms honor, virtue, ethics, what they meant during this time period. Um, and as always with probably every speaker you get here, all views are my own and represent no one but myself. So this is the book um, and it's really, about a concept of what did honor mean? And I contend it uh, is a key cause for the American Revolution and it underlies a lot of the founding of the United States, whether it's the constitution, um, whether it's the formation of the military. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a key component. And I invite you to think about the end of the Declaration of Independence. The final words are, um, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And I know when you think about the Declaration of Independence, oftentimes people go to uh, the earlier portions, um, all men are created equal, but it's that last line that really is often understudied. So it's in the Declaration of Independence, people are actually risking their life, literally if they're, if, you know, they could be hanged for treason. Um, but that line, sacred honor, you know, what does that actually mean? And it's not a, it's a term that appears prior, it first appears in 1774, the first Continental uh, Congress. And it's looking at honor as almost a secular religion, a higher law. Um, so the American Revolution against, uh, ex, uh, when it becomes about independence is about more than just political separation. It's also about separation from the king as the head of church and state. So in making it sacred, it's showing that this is a concept that spreads to all sort of denomination, all sort of beliefs. Uh, it's secular, it's civic, but it still has this higher ideal quality. So normally when I give talks like this, I start with this question, what is honor? And I'm speaking to largely a military crowd. So you're probably better informed about this than my uh, than, than the average sort of public. Um, usually, you know, when's the last time, again, outside of the military, you probably don't use this term. Uh, maybe if you've been in front of a judge lately um, or you're a Boy Scout, but probably you don't. And so when you think of honor in this early sort of American period, um, you're probably thinking of this. You're probably thinking of dueling. And this is the Hamilton Burr duel, uh, you know, made more famous by with rap battles and dancing. Um, but people often think of this: two gentlemen face each other at six to ten paces, ready, aim, fire. But what if I told you, to most early Americans, this most visible symbol of honor culture was considered to be dishonorable? because it risks lives, it was akin in some ways to both murder and suicide. So in fact, what we think of as the pinnacle of honor, of honor was considered dishonorable by most people. So what is honor? And definitions have constantly changed. So we go to a Cambridge professor in the mid 18th century. It is no easy undertaking to explain a word which is used by all men very unsteadily and by most without any meaning at all. Meaning most people that use this term have literally no clue what they're saying. Okay. Maybe it's just this one Cambridge professor. Here are some others. An essay on the art of war, so 18th century military text. Honor is a vague expression to which custom has given different meanings. So what does that mean? Honor can mean any number of things. 
Um, Samuel Johnson, one of the early, uh, the early creator of the dictionary, so the, the British version, uh, that honor was dignity, reputation, or virtue. Noah Webster of Webster's Dictionary um, says that honor was any particular virtue much valued. Not very clear, is it? In fiction, Pamela, um, uh, but the protagonist Pamela says to the, her antagonist, Mr. B, um, and a lot of the, it's very much set in these seduction narratives of the, the 18th century. Uh, Pamela is going to say to her antagonist, I too much apprehend that your notions of honor and mine are very different from one another. So in this concept of the 18th century Anglo-American world, it, it's this sort of amorphous term that's meant all manner of things. The U.S. Navy even has their own definition of honor. So this is modern department of the Navy. And it says, I'm accountable for my professional and personal behavior. Uh, you probably, everyone in the audience probably knows this better than I do. But if you look here, does it actually define what honor is? And, and I'm going to pause and offer no comment. The answer is it doesn't. So let's go some quick definitions as they were understood in the 18th century. Honor has been understood as reputation, as duty, as valor, as proper conduct. Virtue, uh, usually tied to morality, very much linked to religion, and a concept of the greater or, or common good. And uh, common good is very much a term coined by Frank, Benjamin Franklin in, in this period. Um, virtue and honor... Again, they have this, it's a really complicated relationship. Uh, we'll come to this in, in a minute, but the two are always very much linked. Ethics, if you use the term ethics in the 18th century, you were probably talking specifically about Aristotle, specifically Aristotle's ethics. That's probably what you meant. Uh, if you delved a bit deeper, maybe it meant moral philosophy or the very helpful definition related to morals. Um, but the term ethical, as we use it today, really wasn't used. So I'm here to say in the 18th century understanding, in the revolution, honor and virtue became synonymous with what we think of as ethics. So I invite you today, when you hear the word honor or you hear the word virtue, to think of what we'd think of as, as ethical in the modern concept, in the modern construct. Um, so this is a fun little exercise. Google engrams. You could play around with this and plug in any words and search in different books and publications in different languages. Um, so this is from 1500 to 2008. And you'll see that it's got honor and virtue, both spellings of honor, uh, American and British. Uh, it changes for Americans the early 19th century uh, from the OR, uh, from the OUR to the OR. And if you take a look at this, the highest usages of the terms honor and virtue coincide with the American Revolutionary Era. And, and this is something I really started to investigate. Um, what is being said? What is being written? Um, conversely, look at the concept of national honor. It's basically not discussed before the revolutionary era. Again, you see a few blips, um, but it's really during that constitutional era, the end of the American Revolution, dies down, picks up again in the War of 1812, dies down again, and then something happens in the 1860s. Who's to say what? Um, meanwhile, if you look at ethics, you see a lot of it um, in the uh, 1500s, and this is sort of the, the rediscovery of, you know, sort of uh, classical scholarship. It dies down, some spikes here and there, but it's really not used much until the modern era. So what's going on? Uh, if you take a look at this top, here is ethical overlaid with honorable. And you see it's in the early 20th century that honor as a term really stops being used, but ethical climbs, right? You know, give or take World War I era. 
So it's really a change in how the terms are used, not that the concept of honor or virtue has faded. It's just that how it's spoken of has changed. So uh, quick rule of thumb, further north you go, um, honor and virtue become separate. Virtue takes prominence. Uh, this has a lot to do with religious denominations in the area. The further south you go, honor and virtue become almost inseparable. Um, and and there you could use them interchangeably. Um, and, and so if you are a Virginian and you say honor or you say virtue, you're almost saying the exact same thing. And little distinction is made going back to this earlier issue of, 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 of definitions. So the book follows essentially four main figures, Washington, Franklin, Jefferson, and Adams, who represent different regions, different backgrounds. Um, but honor is a concept that becomes democratized in the revolution, accessible to those of varying uh, backgrounds, birth statuses, races, classes, genders, uh, through the idea of service to the nation. But I'm gonna start with Washington and show you this progression. So Washington, um, born into the upper echelons of Virginian society, but his father dies at a young age. He's banned from, he's due to finances. He's not able to have the uh, classical education in England like his brothers. He, he, for the, his whole life, he's gonna complain of a defective education. So he's gonna take to reading. He's gonna try and emulate British culture. And one of the things he comes to is The Spectator, which is a uh, British gentleman's magazine. And this is where he starts to take his concepts of honor. A young Washington, point of honor in men is courage. Shame is the greatest of all evil. So honor only matters if others recognize you have it. Um, and this line, I understand by the word virtue, such a general notion as affixed to it by the writers of morality and by, and which by devout men goes under the name religion and by men of the world under the name of honor. So making a clear connection between these three, just in different, uh, aspects of life. Washington would also pick up early etiquette guides, such as, uh, Chesterfield's letters uh, to his son. And it was here that the idea that honor and virtue could advance you in society. So Washington, that's without this formal education, without a father, believed that if he followed the trappings of honor culture, he could advance in society. His favorite novel was A History of Tom Jones, uh, which is about a illegitimate uh, young, young man who gets involved in all sorts of perhaps dishonorable behavior, uh, questionable actions, but at the end it's shown, well, he was actually uh, the son of gentry, so therefore it's okay. Uh, so making fun of birth status while at the same time saying, um, uh, mocking birth, uh, saying, well, birth status resolves all. But in that book, there's this line that true honor and true virtue are almost synonymous. For Washington, this is very much uh, the guide, and it was true for, for much of uh, certainly the, the American Southern colonies, but also as the nation as a whole. He's going to take to writing his own um, rules of civility and decent behavior. Now, you could pick this up in any sort of historical site bookshop now, whether it has to do with Washington or not. And he is, though he's credited as being the author, he's not. It's probably just a exercise in penmanship. But it shows that he is very much well-versed in these, these rules of behavior uh, that are originally from Italian British sources. And one of the takeaways was associate yourself with men of good quality if you esteem your own reputation. The idea of your company matters. Who you interact with matters, and this is the way to advance in, in society. His older half-brother, Lawrence, in, in the red, uh, is going to marry into the aristocratic Fairfax family, and this is Washington's way forward. He gets people to emulate his older half-brother, uh, the Fairfax family, and that's what introduces him to the lieutenant governor of Virginia on the right, Robert Dinwiddie, and that's how he ultimately gets appointed to become the uh, uh, adjutant general of the Virginia militia at the rank of a major. He basically assumes his brother's former position when he dies. Uh, does he have a military training? Absolutely not. 
His brother had the job. That should work. Um, military thinking at the time um, was very sort of straightforward. Uh, there was no military academy. There's no formal martial tradition in America outside of uh, colonial wars, fighting against Native Americans. And so how does one learn to become an officer? You'd read. And here are some um, uh, military texts of the era that Washington may have read. Uh, and it's honor sprang originally from the field. Honor must be concluded to be purchased by venture and a high medal of courage. So these martial ideas of honor. Honor equals courage. Um, in uh, Sims uh, military guide, common soldiers couldn't have honor. And this is a long standing tradition that the average soldier was a rabble. Uh, it was only gentlemen that could have honor. So here you say common soldiers had a frailty of heart due to a want of the, of the principle of honor, whereas the gentlemen inherently possessed this concept. The idea was based on birth. Washington, as an early uh, officer, he's in his early 20s from a major to lieutenant colonel and a colonel. So just for some perspective. So from his early, uh, he starts off as a major and uh, will end his career under the British, in British service as a colonel. He's going to uh, argue about his rank, does a colonial rank of colonel uh, outrank a British captain? British captains are gonna say no because a King's commission outranks any colonial rank. Washington's going to threaten to resign. He's going to march his way, uh, he's going to march his, his soldiers away from British officers so his command can't be questioned. He's going to complain about his pay. He's going to be say, we're treated, we should be treated as gentlemen and officers and not have annexed to the most trifling pay that's ever been given to English officers. He's going to literally read resign his command when his complaining leads to the lieutenant governor to say, okay, no Virginian will hold the rank above captain. Washington resigns because he says, I will not serve alongside of those I formerly commanded at equal rank. And he leaves service. And he justifies it by saying he's doing it for my own honor and country's welfare, his own honor first. He's thinking very much in a personal honor mindset, his personal reputation, rather than a sort of collective sense um, of, of country, whether he means Virginia as his country or, or wider empire. But he is going to come back and he's going to become a great hero at the Battle of the Monongalia after um, General Edward Braddock is killed, Washington rising from his sickbed to stop a British route. Um, and it's during the French and Indian War that Washington is going to come to push back at some of the more aristocratic hierarchical trappings of honor, the idea that it was based on birth, based on connection to the king. Um, and as early as 1756, he begins promoting based on merit that honor was gained through ser the person's service themselves, through merit, through duty, um, not based on birth, not based on connections. Um, he's even going to refuse to uh, commission uh, Colonel William Fairfax, his, one of his pseudo father's younger sons in um, the Virginia militia because he's saying this would overstep the bounds of merit. And he says to the Lieutenant Governor, well, you could do it, but I will not. French and Indian War ends, the British win. That was a quick war. Um, and this leads to one of the more common underst understood tropes of the, uh, the coming of the American Revolution. What causes the American Revolution? Taxes. So cost of the war, cost of garrisoning, um, uh, these new ter territories, exceptionally expensive, the rate of interest, exceptionally expensive. So what it, what's one to do? Well, first, the proclamation line of 1763, which um, it doesn't prevent movement across uh, into the West. Um, it stops the protection of the British crown for anyone that moves 
to the West uh, in, in an attempt to prevent further Native American uh, hostility, uh, more recently with Pontiac's Rebellion. The idea being it removes for the American mindset one of the basic tenets of government protection. Uh, it leads to taxation, but Americans had always been taxed. They'd just been taxed by their local government who they elected, and they gave an annual gift of subsidy to the king. So a gift, not, not a taxation. But in placing direct taxes on the colonies, whether it's a stamp act or a uh, tea act, today is also the anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, if anyone's keeping count. Um, it wasn't about the taxes. It wasn't about the, the monetary amount. It really wasn't that much. It was about what the taxes denoted. And it was the idea that they were a conquered people, a lesser people, not full Englishmen. They had been dishonored in some way. Um, and this is what's going to bring Washington back to service as he starts to, to connect his personal slights with those of the nation as a whole. And when he's named commander in chief, he makes a conscious choice. He accepts the commission for my country's honor and my own character. It's a fundamental reversal of the words he uses when he resigns in the French and Indian War. He's now viewing his country's honor or national honor as, as the pinnacle. So it's less about personal honor, which is reputation and more about national honor. And he views it as a way that the actions of an individual reflect on the nation as a whole. This is a war that he wants to win, but it's one that they want to win well. The manner in which they fight it is just as important as, as the outcome. So when Washington is recruiting the Continental Army, he has very clear criteria for who should be an officer. And it, it's right up here. Uh, the degrees of rank are frequently transferred from civil life into the departments of the army. The true criterion to judge by is to consider whether the candidate for office has a just pretense to the character of a gentleman, a proper sense of honor, and some reputation to lose. What he's speaking of here is that the idea, there's no mil, real martial tradition. You do have some veterans of, of the French Indian War, but you, if you found a gentleman, someone who imbibed this, this quality of honor in civilian life, they would make a good officer. Um, he's really thinking of honor in, in ethical terms here. It's the way in which someone behaves, proper conduct. And he views that as how one fights on the field treatment, uh, proper treatment given to prisoners of war, um, all aspects of what we would view within the concepts of sort of just war. Washington is understanding in this concept of, of honorable behavior. And he reinterprets honor. Um, Washington, like many of the other Continental Army officers, have to learn on the job. So they're constantly reading. Um, and it's not just the Americans. The British officers are also reading oftentimes the same, the same text. And they're making their own determinations here. So for the military instructions the officers, uh, religion was upon which true honor is founded. So the, this idea of religious morality tied to, to honor. Uh, Jay Watson's The Military Dictionary was, honor consists in the constant practice of virtue, and the duty of a soldier is honorable and honest where properly performed. Honor and virtue, again, almost interchangeable in the definition. Uh, James Wolfe, who is a British general who dies in Quebec uh, during the French and Indian War, is going to uh, argue against a drunken, vicious, irregular armies, but a poor defense to the state but that virtue, courage, and obedience in the troops are a sure guard against all assaults to execute their part with spirit and honor. So the conduct of the army matters. From Frederick the Great, the great Prussian uh, commander, Washington, who's fighting against disproportionate odds, against one of the probably the most powerful military in the world, has to come to terms with how do you fight a war in which you do not match up, in which you, in which Washington is going to lose badly in and around New York. And it takes some lessons from both Prussian and British military writers. Numbers are an essential point of war and a general who loves his honor and his reputation will always take care to conserve and recruit his troops. The idea to not needlessly risk men in combat, even common soldiers. 
these were lessons Washington took from Frederick the Great. From Humphrey Bland, uh, who's a British general, uh, his treatise on military discipline is probably the most read text on the era. Um, British, some British officers actually carried two copies. I have no idea why. I can make an old joke about wanting to read it again, but some actually had two copies. And the idea being that even if you lose in battle, you can still gain honor. Honor is not through victory. Honor is through how you behave in the field. If you do your duty, you can be honorable. If you follow orders, and be, even if these, these amount to defeat, you can be honorable. And these are the lessons Washington took, aside from uh, additional classical ones, such as Fabian tactics, uh, retreating until the odds are in your favor. And he's gonna say to the Marquis de Lafayette, his pseudo son, no rational person will condemn you for not fighting with the odds against you. And while so much is depending on it, but all will censure a rash step if it is not attended with success. The idea being, if you um, fight against the odds and you lose, the whole world will shame you for it. But if you, if you retreat, there's no shame in that if the odds are, are against you. Uh, we see similar understandings in the Navy. John Paul Jones is going to uh, make the determination that the, the American Navy, which is, is essentially non-existent in any way against the, the most powerful Navy in the world, which is the British Navy, can compete. So how does he view it? Rather than fighting in a traditional European sense, he looks at raiding vessels, that two or three fast ships are more important, bring more interest and honor to the United States than attempting to meet the British Navy on their own terms. And this was the way to gain honor, not trying to fight necessarily in the same fashion. And he's saying, well, after the nation is established, then this could be done. Uh, Washington is going to state, I should hope every post would be deemed honorable, which gave a man opportunity to serve his country. Honor in Washington's estimation is the ability is gained through service to the nation above all. And we're going to see this in uh, very early on, as early as 1775, with the term gentlemen soldiers. And, and to the modern ear, this may not seem like anything. And nowadays, everyone's a gentleman by nature of being a man. Um, but a gentleman was primarily uh, meant something uh, of education, of status. Uh, officers were gentlemen. Soldiers were not. But in, as early as 1775, we have the term gentlemen soldiers being used to describe the average uh, enlisted man. The idea was it was based on good conduct, noble character. So noble, almost the idea of playing on this birth uh, concept um, in the service of their country. Every soldier was a gentleman. How, what, how did one become, uh, uh, gain honor in this way? Merit. Um, and the idea that it was it was for the militia, it was for the Continental Army. It wasn't, um, it was across society. And it even, we see officers discussing it, um, that honor was conferred on every soldier and officer. There was a sense that one's behavior reflected not just on themselves, but on their officers, on, on their units and on the nation as a whole. Uh, it also applied to African-American soldiers. So Washington's initially um, against using African-Americans, either free or enslaved, but he's gonna start to change. Um, and there's lots of debate, is this a pragmatic thing when the British offer, offer freedom for African-American slaves to fight against their, their, their owners? Um, perhaps, but there's also another interpretation when Washington takes command outside Boston, he starts to hear about the service of African American troops, and it's coming from really prominent places that they were that Salem poor, uh, for instance, was, had so, character of so brave a man. He behaved uh, like an ex, not just like an excellent soldier, but like an officer. Um, General John Thomas says that African American soldiers are equally serviceable of uh, as all, with other men. It doesn't say black men; it says all men. Um, and the idea that after the war, the idea that these individuals are due honor in service of the nation, just the same as, as, any sol as any other soldiers. So we start to see this expanding definition 
Um, there are also flaws in this. Uh, one of the more famous ones, Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold is going to represent the older model of personal honor. He's going to be passed over for promotions by Congress, um, despite the fact he's probably the best battlefield commander. Um, Congress constantly overlooks him. They slight him. He takes it personally. He's ultimately going to uh, betray the American cause. Uh, yes, 20,000 pounds are involved. But his primarily motivation is honor. He's even going to take a lower rank from major general to brigadier general to show it's not about rank. It's about honor. He feels that he has been slighted. He's forced to sign an oath of loyalty. Um, and he thinks, look what I've given to you. And this is how you're treated. You're treating me. Uh, so going for personal honor over national honor. Washington, in a great leadership move, doesn't dwell on, on, on all the negatives here at a moment that could have potentially crippled uh, the revolution. Washington instead focuses on the positive. Uh, when he, he says at the bottom, great honor is due to the army that this is the first instance of treason of this kind. How honorable are we that this hasn't happened? that the enemy must resort to this. And it sort of revitalizes the Continental Army during a period later in the war where there's lots of civil military tension, um, uh, where the civilians are blaming the military for not gaining victory. And the military is blaming the civilians for, for not providing supplies or, or you know, price gouging. But it's this shock of Arnold that revitalizes this, this early discussion of this honorable behavior of, of national honor over the individual. And within a year, the war is, is, is over, the surrender at Yorktown. Uh, but Washington has one last major battle, and it's with his own men. It's at Newburgh, New York. And this is a um, uh, 19th century depiction of his headquarters, which was just outside New York, where the British were still occupying the city. It's, it's fairly close to West Point today. Um, and the men, his, his officers are, are uh, sorry, are threatening to, it's open-ended what they're doing. They haven't been paid. They've been promised a half pay pension for life. Congress has no money. Uh, there's rumors of a peace treaty coming. The officers are afraid that if peace comes, they will never be paid. Uh, so some theories exist that are they threatening to uh, retreat behind the mountains um, and let the British march out and do what they will? Are they threatening a coup against Congress? Um, is it all just idle talk? A secret me a meeting is called. Washington, uh, in a move of leadership, uh, cancels that meeting, saying, you can't call a meeting, only I can call a meeting, and then calls his own meeting, where he entreats the officers to do no such thing. And he uses the language of honor. And let me conjure you in the name of our common country, using this idea of national honor, as you value your own sacred honor purposely linking back to the words used in the Declaration of Independence, to express your utmost horror and detestation of the man who wishes under any specious pretenses to overturn the liberties of our country. He reminds them, think of what we've accomplished, all we have done. Don't risk this for personal honor, for personal interests. And a combination of this and a combination of some showmanship putting on his glasses and showing how, what he's personally sacrificed for the cause, uh, it, it amounts to nothing. Um, and it's, again, an early reaffirmation of civilian supremacy over the military, one that Washington constantly is going to do again and again. Um, in 1783 in Annapolis at the State House, Washington is going to resign his commission um, back to Congress in an act that was unheard of since the classical era. The idea of a victorious military commander surrendering power was rare indeed. If you thought back to the English Civil War or uh, Julius Caesar, or even slightly after this, Napoleon, Washington again showing in action, national honor was more important 
than personal. And um, it become, the ideas become institutionalized in a lot of ways um, through colleges, through organizations, um, even in the concept of, you know, sort of the federal government of, of national honor taking precedence. But it also becomes politicized. And with the emergence of political parties, this rhetoric is constantly used of um, the Federalists have national honor. Uh, that's their true interest, while the, the Democratic Republicans do not. They're only concerned with personal honor and vice versa. And it's this political division, this partisanship that Washington warns against that is going to complicate uh, this term. Going along with this, it's not just politicization, but it's also a generational story. So when you start to have the next generations, the sons of the revolutionary generation and their grandsons coming to prominence, they don't necessarily have these great moments, this great war, this great opportunity to promote national honor, to advance themselves. So they start looking for other means. And that's why you get the increase in the duel. Before 1800, there are about 70 duels in all of American history. After 1800, for about the, you know, a century, there are about 800 known duels. It's illegal in many places, so there could be more. And it's a way for those to try to prove themselves to this personal manifestation. So we get to a, a really prominent incident, 1807. It's the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. And the USS Chesapeake uh, is off the waters of Virginia, and they've recently picked up some new sailors in port. Um, they're out sailing and they're stopped by the HMS Leopard. And they don't, the, the, the um, Chesapeake is under the command of a Commodore Baron, um, despite the fact that the ship's regular captain, Captain Gordon, is on board. Baron, as by nature of the higher rank, has the command. And he thinks it's just going to be some sort of communication. The British captain uh, informs him that they have taken four British subjects aboard. Uh, Baron denies it and refuses to return them to the, uh, uh, to the British. The British then fire a warning shot followed by three full volleys of uh, uh, 26 cannon. The Chesapeake is caught unaware um, Baron is, is screaming uh, that he's going to have to surrender, but just fire one shot for the honor of the flag. And as the flag is going down, there's debate. Uh, is the flag down or is it still up with the shots fired? And throughout the nation, this is viewed as infringement on national honor, uh, also personal honor, um, this idea of impressment. Um, only one of these, these, these uh, men was actually a British subject. Um, how did they know he was on board? Well, he got drunk in port and was telling everyone he was skipping ship. Um, but the idea was that this needed to be responded to. While many um, are very hesitant to go to war, um, the idea that the America, America is not ready for a war against Britain so soon after the revolution. Uh, many are pushing for this in more of the terms of personal honor, the language of a duel, rather than the sort of ethical language that was being put forth in the revolution. And we see this uh, depicted as Thomas Jefferson uh, avoids war. His depiction in the popular press is one as being robbed by King George, literally bludgeoned, while Napoleon picks his pocket, throwing his arms up in submission, being unable or unwilling to do anything. When James Madison, uh, the next president, ultimately declares war in, in over impressment of, of American sailors and harassment of shipping, among other things, it's going to be viewed as this sort of masculine martial response, a duel between nations. And you'll see that in the depictions where we now have James Madison punching the king in the nose, showing that America is not willing to um, 
uh, to stand by and not respond to the dishonor. So taking on this martial notion. So this is the sort of concept we see building up through the Civil War, uh, popularized by individuals like Andrew Jackson, who focus on this personal martial sense of honor rather than the older traditions of the ethical proper conduct sense um, that Washington and others had been advancing. Um, and it's why we see the War of 1812 celebrated as a triumph of America um, after um, burning of, of presidential mansion and, and really not a lot to show for this war. It's about new generations redefining what honor means and the path to it. And then when we get to the Civil War, it's about looking at different interpretations of what national honor means and does personal honor trump national honor? And, and, and we see this at that moment, but I'm gonna stop for there and I, I'm happy to answer any and all questions or uh, have, a, have an open discussion.